and there we are. Oh, so, do you think um, of like getting some models and just start working on them? Yeah, you can. I mean, we've got a hobby <laughs> hangout on a Friday, <laughs> so turn up to our hobby hangout. Yeah. Um, welcome, Wargamers. Welcome, everybody, for um, this brilliant interview tonight uh, with Gav Thorpe. So we've got a load of questions from yourself. We've got a load of questions from uh, Wargamer Online, all of us. And we're going to try and get through as many as possible. We're going to aim for an hour and um, we've, we're going to try and keep it as structured as possible. So give us your questions in the chat. Phil is going to be manning the chat this evening and he's going to be writing down as many questions as he can. And we'll go through them at points uh, wherever it's possible. So joining us tonight, we have Gavin Thorpe. Hello. Um, obviously renowned in the uh, industry of creating games, uh, designing games. Uh, author of best-selling books, um, you're creating a game, uh, well, you've already created a game, which you're demoing this weekend. We're going to go into that a little bit later as well. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. We've got Phil with us as well, the beard. Hello. Um, I'm manning the chat, so I'll try and keep as quiet as possible. I might mute in between as well, just uh, so the keyboard doesn't annoy Sam. That's fine. That would be much appreciated. Um, right, so we're gonna we're gonna kick it off. We're gonna start with the first segment. So, pretty much, Gav, how did your involvement with Games Workshop and Warhammer all start? Um, I well, my <laughs> the first time I applied to work for Games Workshop was at Games Workshop Retail, and they turned me down twice, <laughs> which was the biggest break I had, I think, um, not ending up working in a store. But um, I, uh, it was Games Day, nineteen ninety three. I uh, accosted designer Jervis Johnson with some Blood Bowl rules that I'd written at home for Zotes and Bull Centaurs, of all things. And I showed them to him and he, he quite liked them, but he said, uh, don't give them to me now, I'll lose them. So uh, could you send them to me at the design studio? So uh, I did that. I, I typed them up all properly. I put them in an envelope with some other stuff that I'd written and typed up on my mum's electric typewriter. <laughs> Um, and I, put, I decided to put a cover letter in and just said, hi, this is me. This is some stuff I've written. Um, I think I said, I'd be happy to come and empty the bins for you if you want. <laughs> um, but, you know, a job would be really nice. I was lucky enough, actually, that they were hiring assistant games developers at the time. They had three positions open. Uh, and for a couple of different reasons, um, two, two out of the three initial candidates that they had picked had dropped out so they were looking for two more and then i just bimbled along with my letter and some stuff what i'd written um and so they 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 asked me to come up to the design studio in nottingham i had an interview with rick Priestley, which was just you know one of those you know, job interviews are kind of fairly nerve-wracking as it is but when it's like the guy who created one of the games that's been a huge mm. part of your life for probably at that time for like you know eight nine years um and then I had a tour around the studio and got to see, you know, the miniature designers and saw Andy Chambers and Jervis Johnson in games development and all sorts of stuff. So I was actually quite, kind of pretty happy just having done that, yeah. regardless of what happened with the job. Yeah, so you got, yeah, got star at the same time. Yeah. Well, the retail one was quite good because I'd, I'd had the interview at the what was then the factory in Eastwood outside Nottingham. And at the end of that, they let me run around the lead racks with the box and said, you can fill that and take that home with you. So I've got like, you know, I've, I don't know, probably about a hundred quid's worth of free lead out of that. Unfortunately, I didn't, I, I planned it quite well. I, I looked around the racks and I kind of lined the bottom of the box with Bane blade holes, epic Bane blade holes and stuff like that. I got some space wolf stuff for my mate. I didn't leave him out. Um, and then I got a load of what were then metal tyrannid warriors because the, 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 I think the, um, the army list hadn't been long in White Dwarf, and so I was on a bit of a Tyranids kick. But unfortunately, the way the, the, the bins have been set up, I ended up with two. So I, I think I got six bodies, and then I ended up with like basically 12 sets of left arms and <laughs> left legs, and no right arms and no right <laughs> legs. So it was like, oh, that was a bit of a bust. Um, yeah. So, the, the, yeah, so the design studio job, they basically they called me after the weekend, and I started a week later as an assistant games developer, which was basically um setting up uh, uh, a product a, a sort of a project i suppose called the citadel journal which back in the day um in the early days of games workshop was essentially how they released they, they had a, a publication called the citadel journal which was how they released warhammer rules for new miniatures that were coming out from citadel 
um, so they resurrected the the title, and it was like a fan, it was kind of a professionally made fanzine, yeah. really. Um, but then the other thing we were doing was we were play testing the games that they were working on and, and learning how to be a games workshop game developer, really. Um, my very first job walking in the door, sat down, uh, and Andy Chambers came over with uh, a whole bunch of printouts of what were the um, war gear cards for the Dark Millennium supplement for yeah. Second Edition 40K, which had so Second Edition 40K had just been released that game day. Um, so Dark Millennium wasn't out. My first job was just cutting those out with a scalpel and using spray mount to stick them to some playing cards to play test versions of the cards. <laughs> that was my introduction to games dev, was doing manual paste up. But, um, so yeah, that, that was, and then from there, um, sort of a year later was moved to White Dwarf as part of that sort of learning experience. So learning layout and photography and again, more journalistic style of writing and and all that kind of editorial side. And I was on White Dwarf, I think, for about two years before, and then went back to games development and wrote Sisters of Battle Codex, and it all kind of carried on from there. For I was there for 14 years in total. So mm. so there's a lot of experience before doing all of the uh, the, the more recent stuff, the novels and the, the actual um, the, the game designing later on. There's a lot of pre-experience. Um how well, some overlap. I mean, I think because this year is the, the 20th anniversary of Black Library. So, and I was, I was fortunate enough, I was sitting like, you know, three desks down from Andy Jones, who was the guy who set up Black Library. So, um, so you know, there was about 10 years of overlap, really, when I was, I was working at Games Workshop as a games designer. And then in my spare time, at weekends or in evenings, I was writing freelance for Black Library short stories and novels. So that's how that side of the, again, really just lucky in terms of being in the right place when a, a company I worked for happened to launch a, a um, fiction imprint. So that's kind of how that side of things started. So in wow. terms of writing, how did you, well, one, one thing I've always been interested in is how did you make the plunge into writing? Did you have past experience? Did you um, have a, a degree or qualifications in it? Or was it something <laughs> you've just developed over time? Yeah, no, it was. It was one of the reasons um, I hadn't, I'd seen the original assistant games developer advert in White Dwarf um, and I hadn't applied for it because I'd looked at what they wanted and it was a sort of a, a, um, uh, and they, so they were looking for somebody probably 21 or over and you know I was 19 at the time I'd sort of I did a lot of my GCSEs I squeaked squeaked a D in my A level art mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and didn't pass my sociology A level because I couldn't be bothered um, <laughs> So originally, um, when I was it's sort of like in my teens, I was my big plan was to be an illustrator. I'd, in my younger teens, I was kind of involved with, and sort of like looking at doing technical drawing and sort of something maybe like that. But it kind of evolved more with the Games Workshop influence, really. I suppose into wanting to do more of an illustration. And I had a course kind of plotted out of I did my RA level and then you do a foundation course at college. And then I had a three there was a three year illustration course at what was then Manchester Polytechnic mm -hmm. um, and so that was going to be the sort of progression from from about 16 onwards but then after I'd completed my A-level and I went to the interview at the college for the foundation course they said yeah you're all right but you're not quite there yet so we, there's this sort of one year bridging course between the A-level and foundation it's another five years in education actually um <laughs> And I'm not really cut out for that. So, <laughs> so that went, you know, and, and frankly, you know, I just wasn't very good. I suppose I would have continued with something. Um, I, I've kind of let slip, but concentrated on the writing. But at home, I was just writing games um, for myself and sort of doing role playing. So, you know, games mastering, role playing games and things like that kind of teach and running adventures, both of my own and from sort of supplements and things that gives you a bit of an idea about how story structure works and narrative and characters and things. So um, I didn't have any professional training before I, I joined Games Workshop and essentially learned more in the first three months about writing and grammar and everything. I mean, I could string a sentence together and it, you know, I was, my English was quite good, but it wasn't in any way educated, if yeah. that makes sense. I had to reset my GCSE English language twice <laughs> and my English literature once to get a C or above. So it was, uh, and, and one of my teacher at the time, um, jokingly, I think, but he did, you know, I do remember he just said, oh, well, you, you're not going to do writing for a living anytime soon. Wow. Well, you've, you've wow. I was going to send him a copy of my first novel, but. 
Yeah, just send, send them a stack right, of the rest though. of them now. We can just send them a whole pile. <laughs> we've got a couple of quick points yeah, coming in yeah. from the chat. So um, we've got Zach Daniels saying he's off to work, but he so he's going to catch the show later. But he wanted to let you know he's a big fan and loves your work. Um, Talek That's is nice saying that uh, 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 Jane Zarbuck has just arrived today, so this is perfect timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Neil Malden as well saying he still remembers when Gav started with GW. He looked even younger than Sam, so uh, uh, you still look, <laughs> you, you still look young now, sir. And Armor Freak saying he made the it. Gone these days, it? Yeah. <laughs> Armor Freak just saying he enjoys your books. So uh, that's a, a few, quick a couple of quick shout outs before we move on to the next question. Um, yeah, okay, so the next question is, this one's from Cynthia Sned, uh, Sned or Sneed. I, don't, I haven't confirmed which one it is yet, but um, she's asked, what is your favourite project that you've worked on, either game design or writing? Oh, well, I mean, I think we're going to probably get into this a little bit more later, because I think they're just they're different sort of disciplines and different challenges, so I don't prefer one over the other. Mm -hmm. the, odd, the, odd, the odd thing, of course, is when I was developing as a... Um, as a profession, as it were, and the, and the fiction writing was in my spare time, then that felt more like a paid hobby. Whereas these days, it's the other way around. I spend, you know, most of my time writing fiction. On the games design side, is more like a paid hobby. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a different relationship you have with it. When you join, when I joined Games Workshop, you know, I sort of, you, you, I had fundamentally changed my relationship with Warhammer and 40k and, and Toy Soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's something I've only just recently, you know, all this time, you know, I left games workshop uh nine years ago now and i'm only just kind of re-establishing more of a just a hobby fan base relationship with those games um but yeah the, the thing i worked i think the thing i enjoyed most was the inquisitor game yeah um it was i was you know i i was able to work um with john blanche um who was you know driving forward a lot of the visuals and cool concept stuff it was a completely sort of um a fairly free project you know i was kind of given fairly free rain how i wanted to run it been able to delve into the imperium and the inquisition in that detail and the background level was really cool and it's my style of game it's more narrative you know anyone who'd read most of my battle reports in my dwarf will know i'm not exactly the the hard edge hardcore competitive gamer i'm much more the storytelling side of stuff so a game based around that was um uh what was it was just up my street really but also um yeah, just as a product itself, you know, uh, Carl, um, Carl, Steph Kopinski, who worked on a lot of the graphics and the visuals side of it, and it all coming together, it was just a, a great team to work with. Mm. When she designers creating the characters uh, and kind of trying to imbue them with as much kind of visual interest, but also their backstory is making it a bit different. Yeah. You know, so it's quite characters like Eisenhorn, who kind of went on from, you know, a lot of the stuff we created, although Inquisitor has been our production for a long while and there's still a bit of a following and the Inc. 28 kind of and Inquisimunda is still going quite strong and that, quite a bit of that's thanks I think to the, a lot of the interest from the Blanchitsu column and John Blanche's continued involvement with it but actually that law that I created it's it's still very much enriching um the the 41st millennium you know creating stuff you know creating stuff like the Death Watch and I say, and the, and the factions of the Inquisitions and things. So uh, that's the that's my legacy. I feel of all the things. That, although I did lots of cool things working on Eldar and Dwarf Army books and and um, and various games. You know, um, I, I think as a legacy and and thing that I enjoyed the most was probably Inquisitor. Yeah. Um, on the novel side of thing, I don't know. It's always the latest thing is always the most fun thing. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a good legacy to have as well. You, you generally Eldar, don't hear. Um, any negative stuff when it when it's re refer uh, when you're referring to Inquisitor, there's never any negatives. Um, everyone yeah. talks how fondly how how nice the game was, how how brilliant the models were, and how it played it was just perfect. So um, it's yeah. it's a good legacy, especially with yeah. the Death Watch and everything else you've created. Yeah, as soon as you mentioned it, a couple of people popped up straight away saying Inquisitor was amazing. I've still got the book. Akari is saying still got the Eversor Assassin and Tedious Payload looking at the rule book on my shelf now so yeah a lot of lot of fond <laughs> memories and uh, a lot of fun good looking book actually yeah. <laughs> uh, awesome. no it is it's one of those um sort of returning to i'm sort of returning to inquisition in a, in a in a book fairly soon um so i've kind of been delving back into some of that stuff and john french has got his new 
series based on Inquisitor Covenant coming out, and there's, so there's a lot of it. There's a bit of a resurgence of that sort of background, um, and a bit of a move away from, well, not move away from, but in addition to like all the Space Marine stories and things. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. And so, um, and I, the other thing I think on the Black Library side, I really enjoy doing actually is the audios. I think um, I have a lot of fun with those and, and kind of coming up with mad sound effects to try and challenge the sound designers um, <laughs> and things like that. So, and the, and the latest ones, I think particularly the, the two that came out, which were sort of part of the Gathering Storm or sort of follows on from the Gathering Storm narrative, which was the Eye of Night and the Hand of Darkness. Um, I really kind of pushed that and you can, and so did the, the um, Matt Renshaw, the audio producer, and they're, they're magnificent. I listened in back to them. You just think, oh, actually they've done so much cool stuff with my words. And um, oh, I've forgotten the name of the actress that plays Greyfax, but she's amazing. She just really nails the character. So it's one, and it's one of those. Well, having listened to that, I want to now write more Greyfax, yeah. just based on her performance in audio. So, yeah, just to keep fueling. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've got three questions here from Akaria. So um, we've actually got quite a few questions still to get through. But um, the first one is: What challenges did you find in the transition from games developer and designer to author? Um, and you've and the next part is which do you prefer? But you've already gone over that they're very different and they both have mm. um, positives, I imagine, and negatives. So, um, how did you find the transition? Yeah, well, there's um, they sort of they're, they're both obviously very creative roles, but they fire on two different types of creativity. I think um, in games development is quite is is actually really um, sort of triggers what I enjoy about kind of process and systems based stuff you know you're trying to create mechanics and and a flow to a game and a style so the, the mechanical underpinnings of a game which and probabilities and all that slightly um kind of hands-on stuff and then trying to actually find the words to explain it and, and kind of convey a world or a, a thing around that yeah. whereas obviously the fiction pure prose style is very much a different style of writing to say a codex or a rule book um, uh, and, as, and the other big difference is that you know a games games development tends to happen as part of a team especially games workshop you know with artists and miniature designers and um, production and editors and all that sort of stuff whereas writing is you know me in front of a keyboard mostly for hours on end and then occasionally getting an email from an editor or having a conversation with an editor yeah so they're very different pursuits. Um, and I think, and, and because they're different, I, it's why I can balance the two, I think. And don't, you know, it's like I, I can spend, you know, the best part of a day working on a novel and write 4,000 words on a novel, but then in the evening, I'm actually quite raring to go to write some rules because actually it's it's a, hitting a different pleasure centre. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, my creativity, and actually it's a, more of an engineering building sort of thing, which I never, you know, which it, Although I approach my writing in a very structured way, I'm always about planning and things. When I'm actually hitting, you know, hitting the keyboard and getting the words out, it's all it's all about being in the flow. Whereas um, there's a much one's a much more intellectual creativity and one's more emotional creativity. I think. Yeah. So one's yeah that makes perfect sense. Um, another one that's in line with that <laughs> is um, where was it? I've lost it. I had it a second ago. It's completely gone. Well, shall I jump in with a couple of quick yeah, questions? Yeah, for that. So, um, by the power of Google, by the way, it's Emma Gregory who did the voice for Greyfax. Does that sound familiar? Brilliant. Emma. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody look up the work anyway, and it's a great audio as well. Um, Dance Macabre is saying, any temptation for Gav to revisit the Last Chances novels? Yeah. Oh, they're amazing. <laughs> I really liked. I mean. <laughs> Considering how I ended, um, you know, I, at the time, because I'm I'm a sucker for the new thing, um, really. And it's one of those, I, I, I really remember at the time and looking at Dan, who was obviously doing Gaunt's Ghosts, and you know, that was going to be trotting into book six at the time or something like that. And I'd got to the end of this trilogy and I was like, kind of a bit done with these guys, really. Hmm. How do I end this in such a way that it's obviously ended, kind of? Um, <laughs> I really... Um, yeah, I really missed Cage in the last chances, and, and um, uh, I keep I, I now and again I mention to Black Library, and I, or when you know people ask, and I would like to do a prequel. I think. No, I was just about to say, but yeah, so on I, 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 I
Um, we've, okay. But, or, or do something really mad and actually find out what happened to Cage after at the end. And I've got some ideas percolating for that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if Black Library were, were, were particularly interested in it. That said, um, yeah, there's um, recently somebody was asking me about one of the characters, so I kind of had to dig out the book and do a bit of reading. And I was like, actually, there was writing in the first person style and 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 cage being a, it was, it was, again it's a bit like inquisitor really it was more about trying to get this really eclectic weird cast of characters and just throw them together and see what happens and doing that three times over with different you know blow up a thing kill a thing rescue a thing yeah. and it's like after i've done that i thought well there's not many other things they can do but actually it doesn't really matter <laughs> nobody cares they can just blow up another thing rescue another thing kill another <laughs> thing and so i probably should have just carried on i'm not i'm not very good at building franchises i'm afraid i keep killing off all my characters and <laughs> Blowing the end. So. Oh, that's um, that's one thing George R. R. Martin does, and it, it works. So keep going. Yeah, um, well, he's, he's, he's yeah, he does it well enough. That he just creates a, a bit more before. He, you know, yeah, and there's enough of a, a spine through it, I suppose, with the main characters. So okay. yeah, slightly attached it's hard to, to that. Gauge interest. <laughs> we've got a question slightly attached to that, and uh, but probably going to have to be fairly short on this because we've got a lot to cover tonight on some of the other subjects okay. as well. But Akaria has asked, um, uh, "Hi, Gav, long time fan." As a black library author, are you tied into exclusively GW intellectual property, or can you do other fiction slash non-fiction as well? Oh yeah, I mean everything I do is purely freelance. So um, you know, I'm not an in-house writer or anything like that for Black Library. So I, I've, I've I've written, I have a, an original fiction fantasy trilogy out with a publisher called Angry Robot called uh, the the, um, the Omnibus Edition is called The Empire of the Blood. Uh, which is sort of a much more talking about George R. R. Martin. That's a much more 18 slash R rated approach to fantasy. Um, it, we, it was kind of I pitched it as basically a fantasy version of HBO's Rome, mm. really. So it's, it's kind of war and, and high politics. Um, and yeah, I mean, and I, I write. I quite enjoy writing short fiction for sort of small press anthologies, themed anthologies, and things. So I've got a few of those out. I've got. Um, because they're kind of nice little palette cleansers. It's not like plunging into a full novel, um, although I've been working on another original fantasy novel on and off for the last... And I keep forgetting to, to actually do it when I get time. Um, <laughs> so... so I'm, I'm, the only the only big thing, really, is that, of course, Black Library is commissioned paid work, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. so with an established audience and things. So it's... Uh, it's about managing my time so that I can pay the mortgage and, and but also do some kind of um, some other stuff out there. Yeah, keep it fresh. One, I've remembered the question as well now, Phil. Um, Go for it. And Go for Akari it. Akari is asking you some sort of thing. It was with the Black Library books. How um, how does Games Workshop coordinate um, the canon, but also allocate factions and races? So, do you have any sort of say, or is it kind of split up between all of the authors? Um, well, they have, uh, to take the first part, it's, it depends actually, because there's just varying levels of canon. There is no canon as such, but certainly not for 40k, as in terms of, there are, there's all the materials, and, and it's even not, it's not, it used to be quite true that, you know, some materials were more, um, I, I suppose, more solid than others. So, you know, obviously a codex and a rule book was the law. Mm -hmm. And then you get Forge World stuff and Black Library and maybe White Dwarf articles, which are a little bit more on the periphery. But now even, you know, it's stuff going on. You know, I write a trilogy based on the Dark Angels and what they're doing at the end of the 41st millennium. But that doesn't actually define that's what I've written about the Dark Angels in that time. But you have to think of it more like Superman or Batman, where there's various iterations of them. You know, it's like the Batcave looks like this in one, um, you know, there's certain essentials about Batman. And his background but even some of those have changed you know the, the movie or the play or the whatever he went to see when his parents were killed and the names of things but the the kind of the the core of batman stays the same so 40k to a certain extent as well that's true you know minus calgar is the chapter master of the ultramarines yeah um mm. but actually and he's got these certain weapons and things are defined in the rules but actually what he was doing at any particular time he could be in my story he's doing this in somebody else graham's story he's doing another thing um and, and, and that kind of accretes and, and obviously we try not to massively contradict each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's where the editorial comes in, really. Something like Horus Heresy, there's a lot more control or the Beast Arises where people are writing about the same characters. There is a narrative. And I think that's the difference. It's like 40K, even with everything that's going on at the moment, it's a setting, not a narrative. For people. 
and players can put their stories in there and and we're privileged enough as authors to be able to put our stories in there on, on the other side in terms of divvying up who gets to write about what you know black library have a release schedule um part based on what the studio is going to be doing for instance the the legacy of Caliban trilogy I did came about because there was going to be a new Dark Angels Codex. So it was, we would like a novel to come out alongside the Dark Angels Codex. So I, I then proposed what I'll do, which ended up being Raven Wing, Master of Sanctity and the Unforgiven. Um, they didn't dictate to me, you know, when they asked me if I wanted to do it, because I had history of Angels of Darkness and Purging of Catalyst. Um, but they could have easily just offered it to somebody else. You know, nobody's got dibs on any particular thing. Mm -hmm. You know, for quite a long time, Graham McNeil wrote Ultramarines, but because he's very busy with other stuff now, just because he's busy working for Riot Games, doesn't mean no Ultramarines novels get written anymore. Yeah. Um, so, um, but you get an affinity for certain things. That's the thing, you know, it's like, um, my storyline isn't anything definitive about the Dark Angels. And actually, you know, Christian Dunn's been writing some cool, um, Dark Angel stuff as well. And we kind of chat a bit and, and kind of make sure that the name of the fourth company captain's the same and stuff like that. But actually, he's got his own narrative he's been building and I've got mine. And as long as, you know, neither of us actually kills as real or does anything egregious like that, then, you know, we, we're happy to just go along telling our own stories. Mm -hmm. We've got a bit more about, this is this is the last part of Akarias, I think, um, which is a bit of a, I don't know if this, this was a serious one. It probably is, but um, why is the topic of romance and erotica not covered? He says, I mean, there are billions upon billions of humans somebody is making love right. So why is that sort of thing not included in um, in very much of the the books? Um, because it, cause it's essentially, it's a universe based around toy soldiers shooting each other. And, so, yep. and there is only war. Yep. So, <laughs> uh, well, firstly, a lot of the fiction revolves around space marines who are just not romantically involved. Yes. Um, and, and so there's just like, just, I think once you start looking, you know, there's stuff in Gaunt's case, but there's, there's bits with Inquisitors and, and various other non-space marine characters who do have romantic feelings or sexual relations and things. But the thing is, the story is never going to be about those because yeah. they're about 40K, and 40K is about blowing things up. Um, <laughs> so, but they can be undercurrents and, and kind of tensions and things. Um, so, but also, I guess, yeah, but, but there's a limited ability to explore those kinds of themes in what is essentially pulp war fiction. Yeah. yeah. We've got some um, questions later on from Beth Rose as well, which go more onto the uh, the Elven or the the Eldari reproduction and um, right. things like that. So we'll talk about, <laughs> we'll have that question later um, for now. So um, we've, we've done that part. Um, right, this one's from Matthew Pink, who's uh, part of Wargamer Online. He helps us out quite a bit. So, um, who has been your favourite character to write about to date, and why? Who's been my favourite character to write about today? Ah, oh, well, I don't. I'm terrible at favourites. I don't do favourites. <laughs> I, I do moods. Yeah. You know, I'm in a mood for a particular thing, a particular film, a particular sort of type of music. I don't have absolute. Kind of favourites, I suppose, uh, and usually it's, uh, and you'll probably get the same from sort of a lot of writers. It's kind of whoever they're working on at the time or have worked on recently. I think, I mean, in terms of favourites, um, I really enjoyed writing Shadow King and and doing the Thundering trilogy in general. When writing about Malekith, yeah, and Alith and Nar, they were really two really cool characters to write about. Um, uh, and Warhammer on the forty k side, as we mentioned earlier, Cage is always quite fun. Yeah. Um, but actually, I really enjoyed Jane's R. Actually, Jane's R is again is one of the most satisfying books I've written, I think, in quite a long while. It's got a very good. Um, it's just a good story. Um, I, you know, in terms of like what I wanted to write and her character journey, I really enjoyed that. But um, so yeah, it's be one of my favourites. The thing is, a lot of the characters I write about just aren't very nice or likable. Mm. Yeah, you know, we can sort of. We can empathise with them on a certain level, but they're you know they're either inhuman killing machines or strange sort of like histrionic <laughs> aliens or whatever, and, and a lot of them slightly worryingly show psychopathic tendencies or psychotic tendencies and things. Asma die actually in um, Master Sanctity as a and Asma the in particular the dynamic between Asma die and Saffron that was really fun to write. So yeah, that's awesome. a favourite. Um, we go on to we've got a, a whole segment on Jane uh, Zar, so we're going to talk about that one in a little bit. Um, but going back to your uh, Malakith, 
part. What are your thoughts on him fusing with his dragon and becoming Malarion? Have you got anything to go forwards on that? Uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see where it goes. There was a lot going on in the end times, and yeah. I wrote the Curse of Cain based on some of the background. And it was a very, it was a really difficult project, I think, because for a lot of reasons. But but one of the main reasons was it was just there was, you know. Um, and essentially, there was more background. You know, I don't know how literally what the word count was for sort of like the background books that the studio was releasing, but we were, we were supposedly kind of going over the same ground in less words in a novel where you're trying to add more character and things. So I, I kind of tried to pluck a thread out, which was Malekith in particular, mm. and just kind of follow through building on what I'd done in the Sundering and the cyclic nature of everything. And that was one of the other issues was just all of this has happened before, actually, and reading through the background, I go, well, I, that happened in, that, you know, that. The bit where he encountered Marathi happened in the Sunder, and the bit where he had this argument, you know. So I, I, I played that up actually and made it part of the great cycle of the gods. And and but that was it really. I, it was it was epic and cosmic, which kind of obviously lays down some of the groundwork for what happened to Age of Sigmar. Um I didn't really pay that much interest, I have much, I have to say. Um, because it was it was the end times and I knew there was bigger stuff coming. We didn't know about Age of Sigmar as it turned out, but we knew that there was going to be quite a significant change. So at the time, mm -hmm. there was so much stuff going on. I'd kind of read the bits that I needed to read to write Curse of Cain. Then I was on to the next project. I, I just didn't have the time to continue write, reading like, you know, 200-page hardback yeah. massive books to, to keep up with it. I was just kind of skimming the material. No, that's fair enough. That's fair I enough. just wasn't involved with it in, as a hobbyist at that stage in terms of needing to know what was happening next in the background i i was having to read up probably on something in 40k or heresy mm -hmm. um the next part was the uh the gemmel awards 2017 gemmel yeah. awards so you've been shortlisted for the uh, legend award and that's done by the uh, yes, thank public, you, public vote so we'll put a link below in the description we've also put links to um, gav's um website uh, YouTube channel and the link where you can go straight through and you can vote for uh, Gav Thorpe on the the uh, Gemmel Award site itself. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about War Beast, which is the book that's been nominated? Yeah, so that was what that was my that's my only novel length entry into Age of Sigma so far, um, and it was quite interesting because as was, you know, it's kind of the mirrors with what's happening with 40k and things. So when Age of Sigma was created, it was determined by the sort of the powers that be at the studio and things that there was going to be an ongoing narrative it wouldn't just be a static setting um and the opening season of that was this event narrative called the realm gate wars which was uh the storm cast you know sigmar's basically opened the veil on the celestial realm and he's his um, armies of storm cast are you know starting to retake the mortal realms from the force of chaos um, but and that was quite like the end times that was quite stage managed in terms of the narrative in the background a lot of the novels tied into very specific events and things being portrayed in that narrative. But when they came to me uh, and asked me to, to write something for it, they said, um, well, we, but we want you just to, to do your own thing. We want you to come up with a cool story that's kind of set with that as a backdrop, but actually something that's not being shown in the background books being released by the studio, mm -hmm. uh, which was a big relief because I don't think I could have done it otherwise. So I was able to create these two characters um, Arcas Warbeast and Theodorus Silverhand, so two um, Lord Celestins of, of two different kind of chambers, uh, storm hosts of, of the storm cast. And very different in character, one sort of the impetuous, uh, sort of um, emotional one, and the other one, the calculating thing. And, and, and actually, uh, I, it really kind of made me start to appreciate what was in the setting in a way, because um, the story essentially is Arcas Warbeast being sent back to the realm he came from, where he was plucked from his the the end of his mortal life, the end of his mortal life, um, where he he'd reigned sort of over a coalition of tribes and had been fighting the Skaven, and essentially was about to lose. Mm. And Sigmar plucked him out just before he got to have his cool heroic last stand. Whereas um, Theodoric, or Theodorus, as he became. Um, was a king in the realm of metal, um, and he had succeeded. Actually, he had created, he was united, the sort of like the dukes and things around him, and actually risen to power, king, and secured a realm against 
the encroach of chaos. And so at the pinnacle of his victory, Sigma plucked him away. Um, and so there's a whole thing about, you know, can, um, returning Arkast to the, the land and seeing what happened to it after he'd gone. And, and there's a bit about Theodorus. Theodorus never, never wants to know what happened. He's got that perfect memory of standing on the battlements, victorious, his wife, his, his wife told, tells him that she's expecting a second child, that sort of thing. So at that perfect moment, he was elevated. Um, and he likes to think that obviously it was all hunky-dory after them, but he knows mm. at some point. So throwing, and throwing these two together, we've basically got a mutual mission to claim a realm gate as part of the build-up to the assault on the, um, you know, the all points and, and the fight against Archaeon. So I actually got to really delve into the characters a bit, which, um, and, and because there was all sorts of stuff floating around about Sigmarines and they're just Space Marines in Warhammer and you know, mm. 40k, actually, I was able to, in, in kind of rebutting those uh, arguments or those accusations, maybe appreciate a bit more exactly how much had gone into developing some of that background in the mortal realms. And I think one of the big things now is the, the, the leashes off a lot of the authors and things, really. Um, and exploring the mortal realms, it's a lot less stage managed by the studio. And I think there's just loads more cool stuff coming out. Yeah, you know, it was very new at the time. There was just chaos and and uh, the storm hosts, really. But now as factions have been introduced, especially now with um, you know the Cadron Overlords, a brand new faction and new, or it's coming to its own. Um, but yeah, so War Beast was just it's just a cool um, it's a cool fantasy novel, but it's about you know going trying to go back and maybe write the wrongs or not not right the wrongs but trying to achieve trying to achieve what you couldn't do in life and being given a second chance hmm. and there's a load of nods back actually to the realm that was and kislev there's a few there's some really cool bits that are just kind of the, the thing about it, just, it just pushes it and said like well do some really weird magical cosmic stuff as well it doesn't just have to be traditional fantasy that's some, so there's some elements in there which are really strange and out of place and mystical and and i had some real fun with that yeah that's awesome. I mean, one thing, I mean, one of the gripes initially when um, when the end times was over and Age of Sigmar came out, it was the Sigmarine thing, like you were saying. There was no personality and um, they, they were just golden warriors. They, they didn't look like they had any personality. So being able to give all of the authors almost a blank slate and say, come up with whatever you can and create all of these really cool stories is the, one of the perfect situations. And it allows you as a as a hobbyist to come up with your own backgrounds without being restricted in a way to previous stories or previous uh, backgrounds you can kind of reinvent whatever you want to do in age of sigma um and i think if i mean the way that horus heresy went horus heresy is huge now everyone loves their own chapters they love the well the legions they love the characters that are in there and i think a lot of that is down to the the novels that have been written and the background that's been created around it and i think as soon as that happens with age of sigma that's going to get a hell of a lot more interest and a lot more people are going to be reading the, the series as well we've got a yeah i think that's the important thing to remember about age of sigma it's the, it's the start yeah 40k is basically the end of everything yeah you know as much as that everything's happened lately whereas Age of Sigma is the beginning. It's it's all it's the if there's any comparison to make, it's actually the you know, it's the start of the Great Crusade. And how many people want you know continually asking for stories or novels set during yeah. the Great Crusade? And so this is it. But you don't know who these characters are because they haven't done their great deeds yet. They're not Marnius Calgar no. or Commander Dante, who all that stuff is in retrospect. It's like you know, as the stories unfold, as your games are played, as the background develops, that's how that you know it's it's actually back to a few of the the old 40k characters i remember when captain tycho was just a guy who appeared in a white dwarf battle report and you know gasgall thracker was a, a sample war boss in a war band put together by andy chambers in um here we go or something like that and then they appeared in the battle report and then actually that story developed and then they became these characters mm. and actually the the lord celestance and the various characters and um uh, and you know the mortarks and all that kind of stuff is all they're all developing their stories and I think actually branching out from the storm host definitely giving giving them more context helps them actually as you realize it's not just them you, you, they, you understand their place in this great big kind of slightly cosmic and unknowable we've got, battle hmm. we've got a couple of good points from from the viewers actually stephen leggett saying he remembers how sigma has risen, risen from the days of leading a small band of hunters and rescuing a dwarf lord so that's exactly that point isn't it these characters come along and 
become something yeah. fundamental. Karana says um, what he loves about War Beast is that it shows how you can make great background story for your Stormcast and that there's so much lore you can delve into on your own. So again, coming back to the point Sam was making and you were making, really, it's um, uh, I think what what you're doing with the books and what the other authors are doing, they're really giving us a sense now of what that what that whole universe is all about, and it's great fun. It's great fun to be a part of. Yeah. Um, okay, the next one. This is from Beth Rose, still on the Gemmel Award. So, will you still twerk if you win a certain writing award? Yes. Well, I do my yeah. It's my happy, happy, joy, joy, jam. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't twerk. I would, I wouldn't inflict that on anybody. But yes, yes. I, I think I've, I think I promised that I would live, Facebook Live or something. My, my victory dance. So, it might have to be after a couple of drinks, but. <laughs> We might we might have to try and get that the exclusive on that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't mind. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay, so we're going to go into the uh, Jane Czar segment now. So, um, what can people expect from this novel in terms of story and events? Again, another overview without spoiling stuff. But what is the most um, the, the best summary you can do of it? Sorry, I, that, I, that broke up a little bit. Sorry. Jane, Jane's R, what what can people expect from the novel? Right, okay. So, well, the Phoenix Lord series in general is sort of like basically kind of do a bit of a Horus Heresy for the Eldar in that um, Asimen, the first one, is, you know, a good proportion of the story is actually, I'd say flashback, but it's not. It's actually an, an, another internal narrative within the story which relates to the main story so which takes place around the event before and around the events of the fall mm. and the formation of the assyria the original phoenix laws being taught by Asuman. so that was the story that was the cool story i wanted to write and obviously i figured those dealt off would probably want to read that as well that's good you know in the same way you know people want to read about the heresy of the great crusade again well yeah um but they but they're kind of contextualized they're sort of framed with what I've kind of been calling the present day story, which is um, actually there's uh, there's like a shadow war really going on between Orthway and, and even Craftworld. So two Craftworlds who basically the upshot is one of them's going to have to one of them's going to get destroyed at some point in the future. He's trying to manipulate events so it's the other one. Yeah. And this and because it, it's one of those it's been it's been intimated in the background and kind of stated in some ways that craft worlds come into conflict with each other but obviously the Eldar are so sort of perilously close to extinction that actually waging outright war on each other would be very costly and ridiculous so it'd have to be very rare so actually how do they have a war and so the idea was it's a war by proxy you know so you read directly orcs onto this human world and they have a fight and then a thousand years later your craft world gets blown up instead of ours well, if you're going to do that, then we're going to actually interact with these humans here, and that. And so, actually, it's a bit. <laughs> the the thing I go to, it's a bit like um, the second Bill and Ted, where <laughs> at the end of it, essentially, and they're having the fight with the bad guy, and that, and it, you know, only one of them can go back in time. So they drop the cage and they're taking the bullets out of the guns. And only one of them gets to succeed. So each one's kind of creeping along the lines of fate to try and outdo what the other one's going to do next until they, they reach kind of an end point where nothing else, you know, the, the destruction of one could be inevitable. So basically, by the dead spirit of Assyria and to try and avoid this conflict. But they've been drawn together from across space and time to do this. So actually the present day stories take place at any point in the last 11,000 years. Um, so the Asherman one is fairly recently, kind of around the time of the 13th Black Crusade, probably, although it's, nothing's ever defined in human terms, so it's impossible to know. Whereas James R, a thousand years after the fall, is happens before the heresy. You know, her present day is still when the craft worlds haven't really worked out what they're doing and Kamara is still built and stuff like that. So, um, so essentially her present day story also gave me a chance to look at the old often a long time ago. Mm. Mm. Um, and so essentially she's been, as part of her, her, her vision that she's granted, she's her trying to, well, there's a, an orc war that's going to attack all three craft world. And actually, and it's never quite certain whether she's meant to make it happen or to stop it. But she, she ends up through various means 
she has to she has various adventures just getting to Walthway because they're just supposed to hide on the at this particular time they're hiding on the outskirts of the Eye of Terror um, to, to kind of avoid this orc war and actually she's kind of so she's trying to kill an orc warlord to make sure the other orc warlord is the one that ascends and then his war will do the thing that's kind of best for the Eldar species but but um, kind of foresees this and he's not actually in charge of the seers yet this is young Eldrad you know He's only a, he's only a few hundred years old at this point, hmm. but in his arrogance, he decides to kind of go up against the Phoenix Lord. Really, so it's the story of the, the present day story is the two of them, it's and, and having this little kind of ongoing battle about, you know, who's actually going to defeat the Orcs and things. And then the backstory, the the story set during the fall, is you know we're introduced to Jane Zara as a, a gladiatrix in a, an arena. She's a, you know, she's a proto witch basically. Um, in one of the blood cults and it starts just kind of uh there's an overlap with ashman ashman in the, in the ashman novel he encounters james r or the elder that will become james r towards the end of his sort of backstory so we have a bit of an overlap so we see those things from her point of view and then we carry the story of both of them forward and essentially it's how she became james r how she learns to control she's got this terrible rage within her um you know sort of like the touch of cain upon her so how she looked learns to channel that and and between them they go exploring trying to find other survivors that can sort of like um, start to learn um, the path so and then two stories basically have overlapping themes and, and ideas between them between the present day and the past and so how she is still the same person she was hmm. and things about the, the phoenix lords aren't being incarnated as such like the exarch so they're still the same spirit from from you know the original Eldari that donned the suit at the start, so and then there's lots of cool fights with dark Eldar and orcs and things. So yeah, it was yeah. good fun. <laughs> very very interesting book to pick up, if only just to get a glance at all of the the, the past and um, flesh out some of the story. Um, a bit more, I think this one's from Phil. Is this yours? Why is Jane's R so accepting of Ined? And is it Ined or Yined or how do you pronounce that? I believe <laughs> well, it was Iniad when I invented it. Um, Iniad. <laughs> Iniad, go. yes. Well, th yeah, that, well, that was one of the interesting things that, because I wrote Jane Zarr before, I'd really seen most of the Gathering Storm background. Um, and I managed to kind of, I got a bit of it towards the end and incorporated little nods towards it. So it's not really, a, it's, not a, um, it's not a story about the Gathering Storm, but actually there's a few little bits that you could read into it hmm. that are... Um, hints towards stuff that are going to happen 10,000 years later sort of thing um, and, and the idea that maybe this Orthway uh, Anuiven um, kind of conflict it plays into the creation of the Great Rift and all this kind of stuff so um, uh, but that said I've, I've just written another Eldar novel which was released later in the year which very much is called Ghost Warrior <laughs> and, very deal, and it's, it's, it's my book One Rides of the Inari um, so that deals with James R is not actually in that, but that deals a lot more with the Indian side of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I have been thinking about it, and I think it's because she's the messenger of death. She's James R. You know, she's a banshee, um, and there's the whole deal with there's a uh, with Morai Heg. You know, uh, in the mythology, mm -hmm. Morai Heg was the mother of the banshees, uh, and the crone swords that uh, Ivrain and the others are seeking of the five fingers of Morai Heg, that sort of stuff. So she's bound up into the mythology and sold on that already. And I also think there's just a whole, it's like, there's kind of like a sisterhood thing that she's got going with both arena fighters. Um, the thing about the Inari is that they're the major characters, but all of them really are kind of, they're looking for a place, you know, sort of like both the Vizark and Ivrain and, and some of the others have never quite settled. They were kind of craft elders or Camorans or, or sort of like um, yeah. uh, outcasts and things. And they've drifted from place to place. And actually the Inari, the cause of Iniad, has given them a, a home, really. And James R's quite happy. Um, you know, she's she's always been seeking this kind of peace. Um, she is the storm of silence. It's like the storm of silence refers to kind of that, that little eye of the hurricane that she can kind of find within herself where that rage has gone. But actually quite happily end it all you know not necessarily she wouldn't commit suicide but you know like the, the death of the Eldar species uh, and their rebirth isn't something that 
you know, she's frightened of. That's something she could happily bring about and in the hopes that it re her own rebirth that she's witnessed could be, you know, repeated for the entire Eldar species. What's that? Cool. Um, We've got a couple of comments, sorry, Sam, just to jump yeah, in, no, from no. Uh, Talek saying, uh, enjoyed the book greatly. Also, thank you for signing all 1,250 limited edition copies. How long did that take you? <laughs> yes, yeah, well, there's a video, actually, talking about my YouTube channel and Facebook. Um, there's a video of me signing some of them. I've got a very quick signature. My my very first event after I became assistant games developer, I think it was Golden Demon 1994, and I was signing copies of the journal and uh, maybe White Dwarf, I can't remember. And I was using my proper check signature, you know, sort of. And uh, and at the end of the day, I, I had cramp. Uh, so, <laughs> so, I, so I'd sign stuff just gav now and a little squiggle underneath kind of, and that's it. And I can I can kind of knock that out once every couple of seconds, really. But if, <laughs> the thing is signing that okay. many. I mean, I think the most I've signed was three and a half, three and a half thousand for one of the heresy forge. Oh. Gorak Soul Forge. But halfway through, you sort of zone out because it's all done on muscle memory. You know, when somebody puts a book in front of me and I get the name and I just write it and I sign, and you don't think about it, do you? And as soon as you start yeah. thinking about how you write your name, it just goes all wonky. And and so you kind of zone out slightly halfway through, you know, when you're on book 750 or whatever, and you start thinking, how do I do this? And you start writing, and you're just going, I've, I've, I've just screwed up the A there, hang on. And so apologies for people who've got the slightly wonky ones in the middle. And then you just kind of zone <laughs> out again. And I did it in shifts. I think it was, I think it was over three. Um, and the problem is with my name, particularly Gav. Occasionally, you might find one that looks a little bit like I've just written "gay" on it. <laughs> I haven't quite got the shape right as I was writing the end or something. But it is my. They're all. It's authentically my signature, at least, or my autograph. So. <laughs> Limit, limited edition. Okay. So we've got a few more. I'm conscious of time. Uh, all right. Gav, so we've got 10 more minutes and still a few more questions to go, so maybe we should... It's the 8th uh, uh, edition stuff as well, that's going to be good. Right then. Have you got any more questions, Phil, or do you want me to carry on? Um, the, the, a couple more, There was one which was, um, you know, what would you like to see rules-wise, but and, and maybe we'll just jump back. If we've got yeah. time at the end, we'll jump back to some of those as okay. well, if that's okay. So this one's from Ben Moore. Can okay. you tell any tell us anything about the future of the NRE, either fluff or rules? Will you be writing any dedicated books to the followers of the God? Yeah, so you've already gone through um, that you will be writing books. So, uh, yeah, we're going to get that in the future anyway, aren't we? But is there anything you can tell us now? Sorry, about writing followers of... Um, about the future of the Inari. Future of the... Well, it's one of those... The thing about the Gathering Storm stuff and, and the new 40K is more ongoing storylines, but it's about resetting the playing field. So it's it's not quite like End Times or Age of Sigma narrative in that actually the elder, there's this new faction that's been introduced and dynamics have changed, but actually... The Eldar is still the Eldar. The big Eldar story hasn't changed as such. So, it really, I mean, it'll be whatever I decide. It, again, in, in that it doesn't actually define anything, but from my point of view, it's just what I want to write as a cool story. Mm -hmm. So, the first book is about, and um, uh, I forgot my name now, uh, Ariana Ariano. So, the, 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 you know, the spirits here from Iandum. Um, yeah. and, and that was kind of the theme. I, I, the, there's certain things that uh, sort of trigger ideas for a series. So the past, the past series was Warrior Seer Outcast was a night, you know, I, and the idea of the overlapping stories, and it was kind of this idea of a, 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 a written triptych. And then actually, the Phoenix Lords. One of the prompts for it was when I first saw Neil Roberts' awesome cover for Path of the Warrior, and then and then Path of the Seer, and Path, of the, and I just thought these are brilliant. I would love him to do some phoenix lords and so actually part of the idea somebody else you know got um uh, he's not doing the covers we've got another awesome artist doing the covers for the phoenix lords but actually one of the triggers was just i want to see that picture him do that for the phoenix lords mm -hmm. and so actually sort of like the the hook in my head for the rise of the nari is various kind of because uh, it's across all the eldar or the Eldari. So the first one is Ghost Warrior, but they might be, they, they kind of hint at stuff. So there might be one that's called Wild Rider, or um, you know. It, so there'll just be terms from 
from the existing background or triplets, which will hint at what the story is about. So, you know, or it could be Incubi or something. I mean, Andy Chambers already part of Incubi, but you know what I mean? So, and the great thing about them is they, I can have Harlequins and Dark Eldar and Craft Worlds and Outcasts and Exodites and whatever I want to put in there. So it's great just to have cool, fun adventures. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, and having written the first one and got into the characters more, there's really some really good dynamics between some of the characters. It's in play, you know, again, it's one of those, it's a bit like, I suppose it's an end time thing, but it's like, then I'm not going to write them finding the fifth crone sword and killing Slaanesh. That's not up to me. And that's not going to happen because that's, that breaks 40k. All it's done is it's added a new dynamic in the same way that, you know, the the Blood Angels find the Tyranids at Baal or the Magnus storyline of things. It's, it's broken things, basically, it's the idea. Lots of this stuff has basically smashed up the universe, the galaxy quite a bit, so we can have a bit more fun playing with the pieces. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, there's two more questions from Beth Rose, and then we're going to go on to 8th edition 40k and have a little bit of a chat about that. There is a question in the um, okay. the chat as well, which we're going to definitely talk about, I think. Um, so Beth Rose has said, uh, will we ever get some fluff when it comes to Eldari reproduction? Well, perhaps not the most important question. I always wondered about it because of the many crazy theories around it. Sorry, which one? I don't know about the theories. I just don't know. You know, is there any fluff about Eldari reproduction? Um, and also, specifically, are there any half breeds in 40k? Um, I don't think so, and I, I don't like the idea of half breeds because I think they're they're distinct species. Yeah. You know, mm. it's like it's like having a giraffe mating with a lion, and you just know <laughs> it doesn't happen. Um, and so, so as much as like, and also like half elf characters always just tortured them a bit, just you know, <laughs> in most fiction, everyone. You know. So, um, uh, and, and I always, you know, although there used to be half orcs and half elves in Warhammer and stuff, again, it was just a fantasy trope that we kind of just shed. Because you go, no, they're elves, they're dwarves, they're humans, they don't. And also there's just an attraction thing. There might be certain kinky stuff going on, which basically, for an elf, for an, elf, an Eldar to, you know, to, to basically have sex with a human is bordering on bestiality as far as they're concerned. You mm. know, it's, uh, it's not just a bit of rough. It's like, um, so, the, well, the Dark Elder probably do all kinds of slightly depraved acts and things. I think in terms of a, a reproductive thing, then no, it, it's not there. Mm. I mean, originally, the <laughs> chief librarian Targiris was half Eldar. Um, so, and an ultramarine. So that shows you a bit how much the background's changed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, but yeah, it's supposed to be one of those, it, it's kind of, it's it's always just part of the story, I suppose, which is they're long lived. Therefore, if they were had any kind of quick reproduction, they would have just overrun the galaxy. So that, you know, by necessity, they have a slow reproductive cycle. I, you know, in, in my books, I've talked about, there are Eldar relationships and their mothers and fathers and things like that. Um, but particularly on the path, they've kind of, because they change, and the person they are at 300 isn't the person they were at 200. Um, the, I don't think they have the same kind of family units. Their culture just works a very different way. Mm -hmm. And so and once they've kind of been brought to their majority and they've grown up and started on the path properly, and I think, you know, it's in a much more communal fashion and they develop much more communally. And some of that, they still have some biological ties, but that's it. That said, in Asuman, there's a very particular scene, uh, the the Yasmin novel um, has her child with her through the story so and you can see some of her protectiveness and how that works for the elder mad psyche and things so and what elder children are capable of psychically there's a bleak scene to say um, in which we the, the full what, when we say the elder are a psychic race that's the scene that's what we mean when we say the elder are a psychic race this mm -hmm. child and what the child does yeah it's quite um yeah remarkable yeah. Awesome. Um, the last bit then, the last segment, which we'll try and get through as quickly as possible because we are uh, on an hour now. So this is the last part, but 8th edition 40k. So um, in Deliverance Lost, we saw Korax trying to make new, better marines. Um, could this be linked to the Primaris marines? Um, and um, we'll, we'll start with that. So could they have been Primaris marines? What was your, uh, was it that far back that they might have been thought about? Potentially, you know, there's um, you know, so people sort of wonder why 
there's a you know there has to be a reason why the emperor entrusted that data to Korax, even in a slightly fragmentary way, and you know, uh, and maybe not necessarily understood. That actually, you could say that the creation of a, with the out, with the onset of the heresy, the emperor maybe came up with a plan C. You know, plan A was the Primarchs, plan B was space means, plan C was something else. Mm -hmm. And maybe he's actually he he always from that point on thought there should be another iteration of the space means. Spe you know, it's been speculated that the space means were supposed to, and, and even the primates were supposed to, once the galaxy was conquered, would essentially either wipe themselves out or go off on some crusade to another galaxy. And essentially, they're not supposed to be in charge. That's the whole upshot of, you know, they're warriors and conquerors, not rulers. Yeah. Um, and that, I think that's the interesting thing with Gilliman and the Primaris Marines, which is that uh, Gilliman was always the most rulery of them all. He was the empire builder. Um, and so for him to control that technology and to unleash that technology, you start to, that's not say worrying in terms of like, oh, from, from an outsider's perspective, but you can imagine that being very worrying for the Imperium. And, and this is some of the stuff we examined in The Beast Arises about when space marines start to go back to former legions. And actually the general, you know, 10,000 years later, they're all heroic and stuff, but actually there'll still be figures in the Inquisition and records and things which still don't trust the space marines. Mm -hmm. um, even the Primarchs, because they'll know it was the Primarchs that turned and destroyed the Imperium. So, and I think that's what the Primarchs, you know, that we, I kind of explored some of those ideas about what is a Space Marine and what is a Primarch with the Korax kind of intervention and the Raptors and things. And I think the, the emergence of Primarchs gives us just an excuse to go into all of those themes again, but in the 41st millennium. Yeah. Which definitely. is great. And it's definitely given. Um an easy option to expand it and put it into the background one thing i've always been quite happy with is that it's, it's games workshops background really they can do whatever they want the authors can do whatever they want within reason and as long as you can make it make sense it's it's all going to be a good thing and uh awesome super soldiers is never really going to be a bad thing especially when you're controlling them um one question from secret yeah uh, yeah I mean, um, yeah and that's the thing it's just throwing something some more rocks in the pool yeah yeah more stuff to talk about. Um, so he's just been saying, if the Alpha okay. Legion have tainted pure Primarch stock, could they reverse engineer the Primaris Marines if they capture one? Well, and yeah, they may have done. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was always, I was always a deliberate thing about well, where did Fabius Bile get a lot of his stuff from, yeah. and what happened? What did Omegon do with um, with that pure sample that he had, and and. And it's just basically, you know, it's just, just a, it's a hand grenade waiting for the pin to be pulled by someone at some point, yeah. either, you know, an author or whatever, you know, or maybe he dropped it or left it or decided it was too powerful and destroyed it or whatever, you know. Yeah. That's, um, it was deliberately just a, a thread there, you know, we do this all the time, especially with the heresy where you're, you're tying down so many myths and stories and things and making them real. You've got to fray stuff and rip stuff apart and leave loose ends to keep it interesting and keep the mystique and stuff like that so mm -hmm. that's just one of those things of like yeah what if <laughs> up to you you know <laughs> that's the other thing it's like again we go back to why the background exists which is to inspire gamers armies and conversions and paint jobs and all. people get into the background in its own right but also it's just part of that hobby yeah. so i always try to write stuff that's going to make people go oh wow wouldn't it be cool if i model an army of those guys or oh, i want to you know i'll talk about particular markings so that people can paint them and you know paint in a particular company or whatever and, and that kind of makes the background and the game one and the same yeah one thing for me is I, I always want to start a new army as soon as i read a book um regardless of what the book is i always want to to get some of the models i think i just need another chapter now i think i need my own chapter with its own unique background and then i can just start an army based yeah. on that um but even is that a good plan yeah even reading strachan and things like that i've, I've started wanting to start imperial guard um, right, what else have we got? So yes, yeah. the next part, I know I said that was the last part, but the next part is about your big stompy robots and Chilcon. So the two of those together, because you're going to be at Chilcon on Saturday and you're going to be demoing big stompy robots. So can you tell us a little bit about what that is? Right then. Um, yeah, the short version, um, for reasons I don't quite understand, apart from that I just like writing games and I like big robots, but I... Um, 
for another show called Robin, which was a, it's in was in Nottingham. I I volunteered to run a, a sort of a participation demo game, and I've had very you know I could have obviously picked somebody else's game system, one of the ones I liked, and made some scenery. I decided I was going to create my own game for it, um, and I had some you know I like writing games. So I've had various rule sets I've not published, but you know they're knocking around and World War Two rules and this that and the other, and then I thought. But the game I really want to do is the game I've not written yet, which is my mech fighting game. So, um, so by the time I made this decision, I had about six weeks to invent a game, <laughs> write the rules for it, and make a board to play over. So, so that's what, and it, and it became big. Essentially, I was going to come up with a cool name, and I couldn't think of one, so it became Big Stompy Robots. Mm -hmm. um, it's a fun project at the moment. The the it's. Um, and I'm kind of demoing it in various events and uh, there's a local club. I've had a couple of games with friends there, but I'm going to try and get some of the other, other club members involved and just make it a, a fun thing. Further down the line, there probably, hopefully it might be commercial considerations and things, but I'm trying not, I'm trying not to turn it into work. I'm trying to keep it fun mm -hmm. uh, and just develop it the way I want. So the game is a 10 mil scale I say robot fighting, mech fighting game in which you pilot a single mech. So you don't collect a force of mech, you pilot one single mech, you're in charge. There's a card and dice system which essentially allows you to manage the power flow and the weapon systems, and then you use the dice um, to, to resolve the attacks and movement and things like that. Um, and it's kind of set in a background that I do sort of short stories for various anthologies and things. So I've just been sort of patchwork style developing this sci-fi setting which is about where everything's been privatized everything's corporate it's a slightly cyberpunk feel i suppose but actually it's the it's the death of society kind of idea so and that particularly includes the military so all military is private contractors there's no national armies everything's corporate and essentially so you are um um one of these contractors really you you are uh, these guys are in comparison to sort of they're, they're elite athletes and kind of Formula One drivers. So they're, they're, the machine they're piloting is kind of attuned to them and, and they're very special. Not everyone can pilot these things. Mm -hmm. and they're very expensive to run. Um, but they're also they're kind of minor celebrities in their own right and they have sponsorship deals and they've got a whole team of guys in the back and, and like they, you know, they're the equivalent of the sports psychologists and their nutritionists and everyone <laughs> keeping them running at peak performance and stuff. And, and they're all just basically fighting, for, fighting each other for profit for Mars. So you're one of these guys and you've got, you've got your mech and uh, and you're going to fight other mechs. And, and it's been developed because I've been doing it at shows and things. The system itself just works for two players, three players, up to like eight, nine players if you want to. It's going to be a, a system that scales really easily because you're only ever controlling one mech. Yeah. It's um, a um, multiplayer. And I'm just, yeah, I'm just running some games at ChillCon. Uh, with the models up and the kind of scenery I've made, people can just come along and give it a go. Um, and there's no particular models. Obviously, I've not made any models. Um, so I've been using them for various manufacturers. I've got some of the um, um, Metal Gear Blitz stuff from DreamPod 9, which is very nice. Um, and we want some of the, a couple of the ones I've been using are actually uh, war droids from Pig Iron Productions. And because, and so there's been various just kind of robot -y type things I've been using, which are just about the right scale, sort of somewhere between about 40 and 50 millimeter tall for the standard mechs. It's kind of how I see them. Um, and so actually, the, the the guys at Pig Iron got in touch with me just a couple of days ago. They've offered me um, a couple of the war droids to, to sort of like use as prizes. So, um, I think what I'll be doing is anyone who participates in the demo game with their names will go in the hat and we're going to, uh, you know, can win a, a pig iron war droid. Um, and there's a newsletter people can sign up to as well. Um, I've got a regular newsletter that goes out every month, but I've got an irregular letter. You can sign up to that and see how the game's developing. And later on, there'll be sort of like, you know, print and play rules and you can make your own dice and cards and stuff, hopefully, and, and play test and send me some feedback on it and things. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to get a community built around it as well yeah as, as part of a build-up um so yeah yeah you know it's like grab a mech and have fun really it reminds me very much of yeah, um Destruction yeah, it's, it's a different it's a different style of game because you're, you're in there managing one it's a bit different yeah yeah, yeah so I, I would say it's um 
very similar to Destruction Derby in terms of, like you say, going in a big arena and fighting each other. But on your YouTube channel, you've done a lot of videos on the individual phases and how things work. And it was quite interesting to see in all of the different um, components and weapons and things that you have to control while you're actually playing the game. And I think having uh, models that you could detach and remove parts and things would be a, another really cool addition that you can introduce at a later date. And we know, we know somebody quite local as well who's awesome at casting and creating things so right might be worth speaking to him and see if he can make you an awesome i've, I've had yeah well that's that's cool yeah i've had various people like sort of sort of sculptors or, or you know producers sort of saying well you know if you if you do want to actually you know do a big stompy robot line and you know let me know and i could do some sculpture <laughs> um i've had I've had people offering to do um, mike marshall of um bendy boards and of, you know saying well if you want some you know scale buildings done specifically for it you know laser cut and yeah. let me know so, so it's quite good having that network of people building <laughs> up this these contacts and things through it I do make a product one day but um yeah it's um it's just uh it was inspired by the the imperative titan in titan legions when we did the rules for those and you your, your plasma reactor generated plasma and then on a very limited way, you decided how much went into the plasma annihilator, how many went into movement, and that kind of determined the orders you could give it and things like that. And I always liked that. I always liked that idea of being a commander, you know, and this, rather than just it being a model you move around and fight like a normal person. It's like, no, you have to manage the systems. And so, the, and because it doesn't, because the idea is you can use whatever miniatures you want, mm -hmm. I can't define what the weapon loadouts and things are. So I've got a card based system that allows you to assemble your mech yourself, you know, yeah. your yeah. your big stompy robot. So because I can't legislate for whether you're gonna go for cool Gundam style stuff or more clunky battle tech things or whatever the aesthetic that appeals to you. And the idea being that the background has all of these kind of stuff. You might in the equivalent of your you know, cool Kawasaki Suzuki type stuff and then more clunky Jeeps and um, you know, and Chryslers or whatever. Um People, they can bring that, you know, because because almost each um, robots, um, well, I can't remember what they're called, Battlefield Superiority Rigs, that's what they're called, Battle Rigs, Battle, or BSRs, or Big Stompy Robots, is what the nickname is. That's, where, that's how I've retroactively justified calling it Big Stompy Robots. Um, custom built, basically, so whoever, whatever the pilot's like. And, you know, as I develop the game, the pilot skills and the personalities and stuff will be as much part of it, and the idea is you'll have drone systems and defensive screens and all kinds of other stuff there'll be a card based contract system so you can do pick up and play but also there'll be campaign stuff the basic idea being try and earn as much possible by taking as little damage as possible by fulfilling contracts from corporations so mm -hmm. yeah um and it's very very different from and the reason i'm writing it because it's different and nobody offers a game like it at the moment i don't think so mm. that's why i, I wanted it's... to write it because it's the game i want to play <laughs> nobody does it so i have to make it up myself I'd say it's quite scalable as well. I know it's 10 millimeter in terms of the, the way you've designed it, but I wouldn't personally, I, I could see myself building a bigger mech, um, like a much larger scale and um, spending time building and painting something that looks awesome and doing loads of weathering and battle damage on it. And having it's it more, more just that scale because that. Yeah, Absolutely. there's quite a lot of models at that scale for that range of that type of thing, isn't there? So. But yes, oh yeah, oh yeah, that, that, yeah, exactly. It's 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 instantly scalable, basically. That allow essentially you can play on a four by four, well three by three, four, probably a four by four is what I've used using at the moment, hmm. and and hmm. the ranges and stuff. I'm still working on all these details of that, but you could have cool, you know, the huge sort of like one one hundred scale gun downs and all that kind of stuff fighting over massive buildings. You could easily do that i think and then similarly if you wanted to scale it down to six mil or what you know, it was six mil for a while but i thought just in, as an aesthetic the mechs that i was collecting were too big i didn't want them to be titans i wanted them to be mechs and it's, yeah. a, it's a it's a subtle difference but it was just important to me that it's a one pilot mech thing not a team of guys driving a big you know it's the difference between 40 foot and 60 foot you know but actually like in terms of what how they look like standing next to a truck and things it, it does make quite a difference hmm. awesome and it ha happens nicely to fit with a load of the drop zone commander terrain because <laughs> that's 10 mil as well <laughs> and phil was a fan of that um oh, yeah. so we've got that that's happening on um that's chillcon you can demo that on saturday at chillcon that's in sheffield um, yeah and just while i'm talking about that or later in the year there's a great event um in cardiff called dafcon 
um, which I'm going to hopefully if it runs. Um, they're just trying to sell enough tickets at the moment. And essentially, DAF is a celebration of all the little games out there, which is basically anything that's not Games Workshop or War Machine, mm -hmm. um, run by Mark Marshall, who does a lot on the, you know, does the Fool's Daily podcast and runs quite a lot of the events on the Malifaux scene and things. So there's Malifaux tournaments, but I went last year, there's a, I did a, an event report sort of thing on the website, but you know, it's like if you want to put you know, the Osprey games and like, you know, I've got some mortals and um, all that kind of thing, um, but also Kingdom Death or, uh, uh, so lots of the games that you, know, you might not necessarily get more than half a dozen people to play. Open Combat, which is the one I played in, a friend of mine, Carl Brown, you're not going to fill a hall of 50 people playing these games, but actually you can fill a hall of 100 people playing 20 different games. Uh, and, there's, and there's basically the developer's pit. So last year I went and the guys, um, so we've now subsequently launched Kickstarts and things. So Paranoid Minch had their Mythos game there. Mm -hmm. but the guy who does Roots of Magic, which is a really another really cool game, beautiful miniatures. And he was there and I got to play that. The Gaslands guys who are doing Osprey, which is basically Mad Max Death Race 2000, fantastic game that I got to play last last year as well. So I thought, oh, this is cool. I'm going to get in on this. So um now just to make sure the event runs um but hopefully if it does um i'm going to be running a day of big stompy or maybe a couple of days of big stompy robots so early august friday to sunday you can go for one day or the weekend at firestorm games which is a great venue as well cafe a bar you know it's a bit like a little warhammer world really so that's cool awesome okay that's awesome we'll definitely look into that as well we'll get some details and uh, we can potentially turn up and do some more mm. Um, well, looking around and buying things. We've just had one quick question. Is that TAFCON or DAFTCON? Or DAFCON? Yeah, DAFCON. DAF, so that's a D, is it? Right, okay then. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> right, I think we'll, we'll round D -A -F. up now. D-A-double-F. D-A-double-F. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Okay. Okay. There, there's so many more questions we could have gone through as well, and um, we could have probably gone for two or three hours, but we have to round it up. Um, thank you, everybody, for <laughs> for joining us in the the live chat. Um, sorry we didn't get through every single question. Um, we we did well, our I, best to try and what, do it. What I was going to say, sorry, what I can do because I do a monthly Q and A on my website. I compile questions and stuff. So if you've got questions you've not used, if you you can send them over to me and I'll stick them on the next Q and A list. Yeah. For the website. Well, I'll do. That's awesome. So yeah, if you have asked a question and we didn't go through it, go straight onto the website and send it there and then you'll get it answered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Email, Facebook, Twitter. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so the links for that are below. They're in the description. Um, thank you to, to Gav. Thank you for joining us on this one. It's been a really good Great over one. an hour. <laughs> it's been brilliant. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll awesome. Keep, so. I'll keep witching on. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, it's thanks. been brilliant. And, and thanks, <laughs> Phil. Thanks for Phil, uh, Phil coming as well, as always. <laughs> uh, right uh, so as of content for the future tomorrow we're going to have our normal hobby hangout it's going to be nine o'clock as, as normal um live streams are i think it's going to be myself and mike uh, we'll see who else is going to join us potentially phil uh, and then we've got saturday sunday we've got the events that we're going to as well so um have a absolutely fantastic evening a great day tomorrow and we'll see you at nine o'clock uh, tomorrow evening so um, have a great one and we'll see you later Bye. Cool. Bye. <laughs>